We have been in the study of the Beatitudes for a couple weeks now. We are now on the sixth Beatitude. It's in Matthew chapter 5. But before we go there, um, I want to take you to a passage in Psalms where this Beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God, actually comes from. So if you'll go with me to Psalm chapter 24, we're going to read that and we will pray one more time and ask the Lord to bless our service. Psalm 24, verses 1 through 10. A Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it on the seas, he's established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness From the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the Word, for you are the Word. In the beginning was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus, who accomplished everything, changed history, died in the center of it all, and raised again for us. So, Lord, I ask that you would help us, help me articulate what you have on my heart, and let everything I do and say from this point on magnify and glorify your name. Lord, we lift you up and we magnify you. We cannot express our thankfulness for what you've done on the cross. Holy Spirit, be here. Anoint these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 24 is the end of a triad of songs. Psalms. It, is, it started in Psalm 22, and it's the Psalm of David. Psalm 23 is probably the most well-known psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, another psalm of of David. And then Psalm 24 ends this triad with Jesus as king. You can look at Psalm 22, which actually starts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The same words that Jesus used on the cross. It is the picture of the cross. Jesus talks about, or David talks about through the Holy Spirit that he says, my bones are, are all out of joint. My heart is like wax. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. They have pierced my hands and they have pierced my feet. It's a prophetic utterance of the cross and what Jesus is going to go through on the cross 1,500 years before it happened. And then you have the comforter, the shepherd in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And most of us know these psalms, but Psalm 24 ends this picture of Jesus as Jesus coming as the triumphant king. In Jewish history, they would sing this song every Sunday or every Sabbath. And it was a call and response. It was almost like their call to worship. Okay, And if you look at this psalm, it has questions going out and responses being brought back in. It starts out with the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who are in it. It was founded on the seas and established on the waters. And then the psalmist says, Who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? And the people respond back, those who have clean hands and a pure heart. And then the last stanza says, Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, you everlasting doors, and a king of glory will come in. And then the people will say, Who is this king of glory? And he says, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And then they repeat it. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, you ancient doors, and the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? And this time he changes it. The Holy Spirit changes it, and he says, He's the Lord of hosts, the king of glory. David wrote this psalm as they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. We we learned about this with our study of our boy David last fall. He made a really tragic error. They tried to put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, They were bringing it back in. They had 30,000 people singing and shouting and dancing. And the cart stumbled. The ox stumbled. And Uzzah put his hand out to steady the ark. And God's anger killed him. Dead. Stopped the whole procession. 
They had to pull over to the side of the road. They put the ark in this guy named Obed-Edom's house, and it stayed there for nine months until David went back and found out the right way to handle the presence of God. The presence of God was always to be handled on the backs of men. The gospel is always carried by men. David comes back out. They figure out the right way to do it. They put these uh, golden posts through the holes. They lift it up. There are three or four priests on one side, four priests on the other, and they begin walking. And every six paces, they kill an animal, and they have to walk through the blood all the way to Jerusalem as they're singing this song. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and everybody that's in it. It was founded on the seas. It was established on the waters. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who can go into his presence? Those who have clean hands and impure hearts. And as David crests this hill and he sees Jerusalem, he says, Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, you ancient doors. For the king of glory comes in. And the gatekeeper says, Who's this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And they walk into these gates with this ark, the presence of God. And they brought it back after 70 years of absence. This is what's going on in the Old Testament context of this psalm. But if you look and find out what the Holy Spirit is actually talking about, he paints a picture of God through the ages. Now, for those of you who were here Wednesday night, my apologies, I've got to go over a little bit of this stuff. Wednesday night was actually preparation for today. But if you weren't here, I'd I'd encourage you to go back out and listen to that message because a lot of this stuff, if this kind of presses your buttons, you'll like this. It starts out with the earth is the Lord's and its fullness. Everything in it, everything in it is the Lord's. Everybody in it is the Lord's. The Lord laid claim to the earth. And he specifies that. It's funny, in Genesis 1-1 he says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He didn't just say God created everything. He makes a specification that I'm calling this earth out. It's mine. I lay claim to it. Above all the planets and all the universe and all the galaxies, the earth is mine. There are, NASA estimates, approximately 70 sextillion stars. That means nothing to any of you, does it? Nothing. That's right. There are, there, you put a 10 up and then you put 23 zeros behind that. Still, still nothing. All right. Go to Hilton Head. Go to Myrtle Beach. Go to one of those places we like to vacation. And go out on the beach and sit your chair down and grab two handfuls of sand. In each hand, you're going to have 100 to 300,000 grains of sand. Okay? In each hand. Look north. That's really not north, but look north up the beach line. And it goes on to infinity. Look south and follow that down through Georgia and Florida and then back up through Alabama and Mississippi, and Louisiana, and Texas, Gulf of Mexico, all the way down South America, then go to Africa, and India, and China, and the Philippines, and Japan, and look at all the sand in all the shorelines of all the world. NASA estimates there are 10 times the number of stars than there are sand. That is an incredible number. An incredible number that God has created. And here's the thing. He named all the stars. He knows the names of all the stars. The Bible actually says that day after day they sing to him. And night after night they praise his name. When God created the universe and he set all of these things in orbit and he set all of these patterns in going on. Our earth, it says, spins at a rate of 1,000 miles per hour. We are actually not sitting still. We're moving at 1,000 miles an hour. Our solar system moves in a rotation of 76,000 miles an hour. If we were to take our solar system and make one rotation around the galaxy, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, it would take 400 million light years. Now, there are billions and billions of galaxies. And the Bible says in Isaiah 40 that he holds the universe in his hand. He can span it between the width of his thumb and his pinky. That's our God. And yet he knows your name. He knows your hair. He knows your eye color. If I know the sparrow, I know you. I'll take care of you. The earth is mine. And everything in it and everybody in it is mine. I lay claim to that. 
Now, imagine the song that was going out of the galaxies when he brought this thing in, into orbit and the singing of these stars, the galactic music that was going on. And at the center of the orchestral praise was an angel named Lucifer. And he orchestrated this, this, this cacophony of music. I mean, he, when it would praise, he was the one directing the choir of the heavens. But one day... He said, I don't want to direct to him. I want to direct to me. And if you look in here, it says this. Who may ascend? And I thought this was funny. This is in verse 3. Into the hill of the Lord. Why doesn't it, why does it say onto the hill of the Lord? Because the Lord lives on the hill. No one can ascend into his presence. You can worship at the feet of the Lord. But you will never ascend onto the throne of God. But yet Satan says, I will ascend onto the hill. When that pride came, God says, he, he cast him out and a third of the angels went with him. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. But here's the amazing thing. God knew it was all going to happen. He knew, he knew that there would be a war that was waged over iniquity and it was going to be set on earth. And it was going to be the human race that would go through this plan of God, this redemption of God, and before the foundation of the world was laid out, Ephesians said that God had a plan. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word for God is Elohim. It's, it means three gods in one, three in one. El is one, Eloi is two, Elohim is three. They were all co communing and congregating and creating. And God says, you know what's going to happen? One of us is going to go ha have to go down and pay the debt that cannot be paid. And Jesus said, I'll step up and do it. I'll do it. And he says, so when I, when I tell you, son, that you have to go, you're going to go. He says, I'll do it, dad. 2,000 years ago, he stepped down onto earth. The earth that is the Lord's and everything in it. And he lived a life. And he beat the devil at every single step. When he was 12, he walked into the synagogue and he confounded the religious leaders. The most brilliant minds of that day, a 12-year-old comes in and he says, they said, who is this kid? Who's his father? How does he know this stuff? When he comes out of the waters of the Jordan, he goes into the wilderness and the devil comes and he tempts him, tempts him three times. I mean, could you imagine telling God, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all of this? And he says, the, the earth is mine. It's mine anyway. What are you talking about? But Jesus beat the devil with the word of God every single time. Even his own mom came up and said, are you really who you think you say you are? John the Baptist questioned him. I love the story about Peter. Peter says something brilliant. And Jesus says, Peter, on this rock I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And then he says immediately something really stupid. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I love that. We can be brilliant and stupid in two sentences. It's amazing. Peter was also the only one disciple that got rebuked directly from God. It's amazing to me. Have that on your you know, resume. God, God directly rebuked me from heaven. Um, all the way to the cross of Calvary, he beat the devil. I think there's a moment when he's on the cross that the enemy, that Satan, sees this like, oh my gosh, did I do the right thing? Is something going on here? Because he says, come down, come down. Come down off your cross. And Jesus hangs there and he holds all things together. And in, in Colossians, we talked about this last week or on Wednesday night. He says, it's chapter 1 verse 15 that says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. I'm always fascinated about what happens between the cross and the resurrection. This time period of when Jesus went into the tomb and then when he came up. It fascinates me because he was not inactive. He was very much, inact very much active. Um, as a matter of fact, when Mary sees him, he says, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to the Father. I've got things to do. Don't hold me here because I'm busy. So I want you to... To, to, to follow me because what I feel like David saw in this psalm was a glimpse 
of what no one else saw when Jesus died on the cross, defeated the enemy, was, was buried in the tomb. And what happened after that? The Bible says that Jesus, in Ephesians, said he descended into Sheol. And he took captivity captive, and then he ascended into heaven. You see, for 6,000 or so years, all of the Old Testament saints had been waiting. They have to go through Jesus just like everybody else does. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but by me. I am the door that you have to walk through. So all of these saints, Moses and Noah and Joshua and Jacob and Isaac, they had to wait on the Savior of the world. They had to wait on the Messiah. It was foretold over and over again, we have to wait on the Messiah. And they were put in a place called paradise. And as they were held there, we, we talked about this last Easter. It's called the tomb. If you want to go look this up, there's more on it. As they waited, they were waiting for the one that would come and redeem them and bring them into heaven. And as Jesus dies on the cross, he goes into the tomb. And he goes down into Sheol. And the bowels of hell begin to shake. And as he walks into the gates of Sheol, and he looks at the gatekeeper and he says, Lift up your heads, you gates! Rise up, you everlasting doors, for the King of glory is coming in. And the Bible says his hair was white like lightning, and his eyes were aflame, and his garments were white as snow. And as he's glowing and gleaming, the guy says, Who is this King of glory? And Jesus lifts up his hands, and the nail prints in his hands, and he says, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty and victorious in battle. Now open the doors. Come on, y'all should be shouting right now. Woo! As he walks in, I love this. These old-time saints, they look at Jesus. And, and he says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy presence? And they begin to look at each other. And they say, wait a minute. We know this song. We used to sing this song every week. We know the lyrics of this song because we have been taught it over and over. And every week at Sunday and, and church and Sabbath, we had to sing this. It's the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. That's right. The one who has not lifted up their eyes to an idol. The one who has sought after God. Now you're going to follow me out of here. Now here's the amazing thing. Because this is what David saw. And I don't think he knew this. As Jesus ascended into heaven, he walked up to another gate. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. And the gatekeeper says, who is this king of glory? And Jesus doesn't even have to answer this time. Because the heavenly host behind him said, he is the Lord of hosts. The king of glory. Amen? Amen. Listen. I don't know that we understand the magnitude of what Jesus has done for us. He paid everything. And I think it is amazing when Jesus sits down, because we're going to go over the, the Sermon on the Mount over the next couple of weeks, and he says this. He looks at um, the people and he says, I've not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. Every line, every jot, every tail, every dotting of the I, every crossing of the T. I'm going to fulfill it. And when he sits down and his first message is this, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What he's referring to is the moment when he says to the saints, you want to go into the gates? Let me see your hands. Let me see your hearts. Amen? I want to see God. I want to be counted with that number when the saints go marching in. Amen? You guys stand with me. I've got one last thing to read. I've rediscovered a, a, a word in the Bible. It's a Salah. Salah. It, I, I, I used to mean it. When, when I first read it, it means pause and reflect. And David says this a couple times, pause and reflect, Selah. What it actually means, it's like the Old Testament mic drop. He's like, there, what do you think of that? So when you read that, it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's so magnanimous that you need to actually stop because basically what it, it, the picture is, I'm laying this on the table. There you go. There you have it. That's all you need to know. 
I had to go to a funeral this week. Uh, my, my cousin, he was 15 and um, had some birth defects. And my dad got up and speak to speak. And man, um, I almost made one whole service without crying. Um, I, I love to hear my dad speak. Um, he gets up and he says, he says this. His name was Christian. He says, when he was born, they said he won't make it a day. And then the next day they come in and they say he won't make it past this day. And then the next day, he won't make it past this day. And then they left the hospital and they said he won't make it two years. He was 15 years old when he died. And as my dad's sitting there saying, God, what was his purpose here? Because he was in a wheelchair. He had, he had, a, he had some severe birth defects. He, he, he couldn't really speak properly. I mean, he could speak and, and, and those kind of things. But there was a lot of things that this kid had to go through that were just heart-wrenching and heartbreaking. What was his purpose? And God said, he had a glad heart. And let me tell you something. We were in a church that fit 600, and that place was full. And every person that got up and spoke was said, I've never seen the kid without a smile. And what comforted me was that the earth is the Lord's and everyone in it. God knows you. He knows you intimately. He died for you. He rose for you. He paid the debt that you couldn't pay on the cross of Calvary that held all things together. And so if you are in a place and the enemy is telling you, you won't make it a day. You're not going to make it today. Here I am. You're not going to make it two years from now. 15 years down the road when you're walking with the Lord, you can look back and say, listen to me, who will ascend the, the hill of the Lord? Who's going to stand in his presence? And Jesus is going to say, let me see your hands. The ones who have clean hands, the ones who have pure hearts, the heart of gladness, the heart of joy. Amen. Listen, we have so much to be excited for. We have so much to rejoice over. We have Jesus Christ in our hearts. Those who have a pure heart and clean hands, they will see God. Amen. I'm going to read this. You can clap. Thank you, Maureen. You can clap. So the reason I'm telling you this, they had this service in a traditional Baptist church, the one that had the mauve carpet, the blood of Jesus Christ carpet, you know, and the, and the, and the, the organ in the back and all that stuff. And I got to look in, in a hymnal, and I almost took one, but I didn't. Um, I want a hymnal. I, um, but listen to this. Listen to this. This was 100 years ago. And some of you know this. Some of you know this. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph over his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain. He lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Father, we thank you this morning that you arose. You are no longer in that tomb. Death couldn't hold you. The grave couldn't stop you. Satan tried every attack, and it was in vain. He, he, he put the mightiest army in charge of guarding the tomb, and you blew through that too. God, we have the same power that raised you from the dead that dwells in us. We have joy. We have peace. We have, we, we have self-control. We have all of these things that are unspeakable. Lord, help us to have pure hearts. Help us to have clean hands on the outside and on the inside. That's what it's saying. Because I want to see you one day. Face to face, I want to see my Savior. Lord, we love you this morning. We praise you. And now we get to lift you up. In the name of Jesus, amen.